overall, the emotional well-being is something that we've been really concerned about. And um, developmentally, we always worry about our toddlers. Will they ever catch up with this lag that they had uh, during the year? So, um, and then the other thing is, you know, no matter which age range, as adults, we the kids look up to us to know what's going on. And so we've been the rock in their life. But then suddenly this year, we didn't know what was going on. So when our kids turned to look at us, once we were saying, oh, yeah, don't wear a mask. Then we were saying, yes, please wear a mask. And first we said, don't go indoors. And then we're saying, yes, go indoors. So it's confusing for them when we don't seem to know what's happening. So that's been kind of, you know, it's like pulling the rug out from under their feet. So, um, so a lot of challenges for our little patient, little guys. Yeah. I'm curious around, yeah, is this something that's around um, just the pandemic when things, you know, get back to normal? Is this something that you think will, these kinds of things will um, get better on their own or are there things that, that um, you know, that parents should be thinking about or that you're, in terms of your advice for, or if parents are seeing these kinds of things? Yeah, I think it will take some time for um, life to kind of return to normal and for the children to adapt. And the reason Dr. Hashi and I are in pediatrics is because kids are resilient, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, you know, and so you bring the stimulation back in, you put them back in their environment that they're comfortable with, you're surrounded by adults who've been immunized and are safe. And so we're hoping that, um, yes, they will rebound just fine, um, but it will take, take some time. And at first, all of us are gonna be a little socially awkward when we go into a big group setting. So it'll take some time, but we do expect, and that's why we're hopeful that this summer, as things open up a little bit and we know the safety of being, you know, just being careful, but certainly returning back to everyday activities. So we're hoping that this will ease them back into um, normalcy for them. I'm picking up from there. So there's a lot of conflicting advice out there. So what do you, what would your advice be for um, parents about their kids returning to summer activities, you know, camp or swimming, amusement parks, travel? Um, it's, and it's particularly tricky because a lot of families like have vaccinated and unvaccinated in the same family. So I'm curious about what your recommendations are for, for um, you know, summer activities. I mean, I really think, you know, I think the bottom line is yes, we, we can do this. I think we can get back out there. We can get back to some of our activities because really we have a lot more information about, about COVID than we did a year ago, right? We understand a lot more about the transmission, you know, um, where are we at most risk? Where are we at less risk? You know, we understand more about the vaccine than we, than we had, you know, even compared to several months ago, right? And so I think that with the appropriate measures, we can really reduce risk to very minimal, right? And so I think that, yes, we, we need to start getting back into some of the activities that we, that, that we want to do that are, is fun for our kids to do, right? And I think, you know, letting our kids know, hey, this is okay, this is how we're gonna stay safe, you know? Giving them those guidelines will really help them feel comfortable too, you know? You know, in terms of vaccination, vaccinated versus unvaccinated individuals, I think the bottom line here is that we're always, we're always going to be part of a mixture, right? You know, even once the immunization is available to everybody, even our young children, right? There will be some people who choose not to get it or some people who can't get the, the vaccine. And in which case we will have to take some precautions to keep ourselves safe and them safe as well. And so I think that as long as, hey, we know who we're with, you know, the, the activities that we're doing and the risk associated with them, I think we can really reduce that risk there for transmission. Yeah, and as far as recommendations, we are recommending that outdoor activities, for example, are completely safe. Um, and then indoor activities with good precautions, hand washing, wear a mask if you have to when you're indoors, um, and then, we know now that it is not a virus that is transmitted by touching or by contact. So it's okay to touch surfaces and it's okay to play with things. Just wash your hands after play and you should be perfectly safe. Um, as far as flights, we are recommending it's okay to fly, but um, just be careful in the airports, for example, mm -hmm. um, wipe down um, the seat where you're sitting down when you get on an airplane, but it should be okay to travel as well. Swimming pools, 
outdoor pools are fine. We do think that pool water is okay. Um, I think locker rooms will probably slowly start opening up now. But um, again, I think it's just using common sense, going into a space that has been cleaned and will continue to be cleaned, um, has good ventilation. So that if there isn't a door or window open, is there an air filter or a purifier in the room? And that should ease some of the, the anxiety that our families have about returning back to normal. And to pick up on that last one around, yeah, our understanding of surface transmission, I know that's changed over the course of the pandemic. Um, so from, in terms of what you're saying, so is yeah, your best advice in terms of about allowing children to use pub, particularly like public play structures or shared toys or even hands-on exhibits at their favorite downtown San Jose Science Center? <laughs> um, what, what are your, um, uh, just any recommendations here around, just again, surface things that, that kids might be able to interact in with? Touching. Yeah, I think as long as they're wearing masks and when they touch the surfaces and they're not putting their hands in the mouth. So I think of the mask as more than protecting you respiratorily, it is preventing you from putting your hands in your mouth. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, that would be a good way to eliminate transmission from hand to mouth, but otherwise you should be completely fine touching play structures. Um, just wash your hands after that before you sit down to eat a snack. I, I absolutely agree with that. You know, I think that we have so much information about transmission from contact on surfaces, right? And we also have a lot of information on how, you know, the virus becomes, you know, uh, like not viable, right? How we can reduce that transmission, right? Just in within, you know, the air and the environment. And so, you know, as long as you know that your kid is, hey, not touching, touching, you know, touching other kids, right? All of that reduces our risk here. And so, you know, I think definitely these, these amazing kind of activities that they can do to help stimulate their mind, all great things that I think are safe to start. It's great here. <laughs> and I will say at the tech, we, we have a, a pretty strict, you know, um, uh, cleaning protocol just to make sure. Um, they are, so I'm curious what other kinds of activities and spaces that you would, that you think are a low risk for kids. Um, and then is there anything that you really would tell a parent, you know, you really should avoid these kinds of situations this summer? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, either if you're going to be choosing an outdoor kind of venue, right, that's, I mean, that's very low risk in itself, right? I mean, do we necessarily want people just gathering in small outdoor places? You know, maybe not, right? <laughs> right. But being able to be spaced in the outdoors, you know, having all of that good air kind of traveling around, oh, safe, right? Um, you know, there, there's always the risk when you have kids who say can't keep their mask on, who are like sharing foods, right? That's an added risk, right? That, that maybe we think about when we are organizing activities, say play groups and things like that, right? You know, do we want to separate the children during those particular activities where we might have a lot of hand to mouth activity, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we are choosing an indoor space, making sure, you know, that there's ventilation, right? There's windows, right? That there's proper cleaning protocols, right? As long as all of that is in place, I think we really dramatically like, reduce our risk there. So. Dr. John, anything you would add or? No, I agree with everything Dr. Hash and I'm on board with that. Yeah. Um, can you share a little bit about just the overall importance of physical activity for young kids? And then something that I care particularly a lot about um, is just the importance of the quality of sleep. You know, how important that is to development and, and how important both of those are to, to learning. Um, the activity, absolutely. So it doesn't matter what age range you look at. We need our kids to be physically active and moving. If you think about a typical day in preschool or in school, the kids are on their feet a lot, um, particularly our high school kids and middle school kids that are moving around campus. Um, and all of that has been lacking this year. Um, so movement, it's good for your posture. It's good for, you just feel good. You feel like you're energized. You need to get out there, get some sunlight. Um, I'm seeing a lot of our adolescent patients with low vitamin D because they've not been getting much sunlight. That affects your mood. It affects your melatonin levels, which affects your sleep. Um, so it's just a lot of, and, and vision. So, you know, we have in medicine something called the rule of 20. For every 20 minutes of screen time, you need a 20 minute break where you're looking at things 20 feet away. Our kids were not getting that at all. They've just been sitting for hours in front of the screen. So get out there whenever you can, do some jumping jacks, do some push-ups, something simple. Um, 
I teach kids CrossFit. For me, it's like simple things. Just do some burpees. Not if nothing else, just go in the backyard and um, you know, just get down, do some push-ups, or get a jump rope. It's very simple to be active, but it definitely affects your mood. Now, with our adolescent patients that are not sleeping well, a lot of the excess screen time and just playing video games after or after school um, in a way to relax is adding to their insomnia. They're not able to sleep well. That affects your mood. It affects your appetite. Um, you wake up feeling kind of blah, um, and you need that sunlight. You need that activity to feel good. So in so many ways, and I'm just scratching the surface of the effect of exercise and um, sleep. There's so much more. So mommy, anything to add? You know what I've found? I found that a lot of my kids who have kept up with some of their physical activity and and activities that also stimulate them mentally, I've just been able to keep a much better schedule, right? Where they wake up in the morning, they're like, I'm gonna eat breakfast, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna get some physical activity in. And I feel like that that has been really great for a lot of our kids, right? Um, they end up sleeping better, they're more alert during the daytime, they're enjoying what they're doing just a little more. And I've found that it's been able to kind of protect them from all of the other stressors that I, I think that all of us are kind of feeling right now, right? So I think having that schedule in place is just, it's really, really important. I mean, I think for their mental health as well. So I, I, I agree, really, really important. And you mentioned um, just that you can um, interfere with your sleep in, if you're looking at a lot of devices. I know for adults, there's often recommendations about, you know, don't, don't look at a device for a certain amount of time before you go to bed. Do you have any recommendations in terms of you know, how long kids should not be looking at a device before they fall asleep? Yeah. I usually say before dinner, if you've eaten dinner at six, 6.30 after that, you can read a book, you can play something, play with the family, but no screen so that it gives your, your brain about a couple hours at least to kind of shut down um, because that's the only way your melatonin levels are going to go up and you fall into a nice deep restful sleep. Um, so two hours before bedtime would be the latest. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, having a couple hours beforehand, you know, I think we all kind of got off track here and, you know, we did more screen time maybe than would be recommended. Okay. All of us did, right? And so I think now getting back to, hey, you know, let's get off of our screens before bed. Let's make sure that our brains are turned off properly, that we can get to sleep and wake up refreshed is really, really important. I have been recommending a lot more audiobooks for our kids because they've gotten so accustomed to reading on the Kindle or um, on their iPads. So, you know, if you want to read a book, hey, yay, I am the first person to encourage that, but perhaps maybe give your eyes a break so that we go sit in the backyard and listen to a book on audio. That would be better for your eyes. Too. As we've been hearing from you, like many kids, um, me mental and physical health has suffered in the lack of in-person social interaction and physical activity in the last 15 months. You know, how should parents balance the risk of in-person play dates or activities for their unvaccinated children, you know, against, against you know, really wanting to, to have kind of healthy lives? You know, I think that once we all feel comfortable and have our, get our parents feeling comfortable with all of, you know, the kind of restrictions and our understanding here of what lowers transmission rates, I think that parents can help their kids feel comfortable to kind of get back out there, right? So I think, you know, it's really important that parents understand, hey, you know what, as long as we're following kind of our recommendations here, we're safe. We're, we're doing the best that we can. And it's really important now that we say to ourselves that we need to kind of push our mental and physical health to the forefront and prioritize it more than maybe we've had the chance to in the past year. And one thing I always tell our families is that our little kids, the ones that are unvaccinated, they just don't have enough ACE receptors in their nose to actually be shedding the virus that much to infect another child. So child to child transmission is actually very low. Uh, it's usually adult to child. So if you're, if you're masked and you're being careful, you're washing your hands, you're not touching your nose and mouth, it should be safe to go back to uh, interaction. And I agree with Dr. Hayashi, the social and emotional development. Um, I mean, if nothing this year has taught us how fragile that, uh, that environment can be for a child and the lifelong impact it can have. 
So I think we need to kind of catch up for this last time. Um, and summer is a great time to do it. The other thing I always tell our families is some amount of everyday germs is good for your child. It actually keeps their immunity boosted. So this year we haven't been seeing flu and coughs and colds. And so now as our kids come back into uh, contact with each other, we actually want to see some of those everyday germs because that's how I know your immune system's working. And that's how I know your immune system's not going to completely crumple if, if COVID does affect your child. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, like what long-term effects the might this past year have on kids' ability to build friendships with others? And if there's anything parents could do about that. I think parents can ease them back into um, maybe not introducing them into a big group at one time, but maybe doing smaller groups and ease them into these relationships again. Um, and again, like I said, kids are resilient. They will bounce back and they will make relationships again. Hopefully won't have a long-term impact. I think if we're looking at long-term impact, it may be the way you view germs and the way you view, um, oh, well, is that really necessary? Can't I do it on Zoom? Do I really need to come out and meet you in person? Oh, well, Zoom birthday parties were actually not so bad. Maybe we shouldn't do in-person birthday parties. So I think that maybe we'll see a little bit of, but, um, but I think kids and humans in general, we crave contact with other people. So I think it won't be long before we forget this phase and move on, I hope. When I've heard, and in fact, I think we've got a, a, uh, someone who in the audience is also bringing up a very similar question um, about kids who are like eight and nine years old who are reluctant to try new things and have lost confidence. Um, is there anything that we can do to help build that esteem back? Um, you know, how can parents help their kids feel safe returning to these activities, you know, including any you of know, the big one, which is you know, returning to school in the fall if they've not already done so? Yeah. You know, um, and I, I've had a lot of kids kind of come to me and say, you know, hey, they've stopped talking to friends. They have the opportunity to see them via Zoom, but it's just, it's not the same, right? Mm -hmm. And I totally get that. I mean, I think all of us, you know, it was difficult to just, you know, stare at people and, and hope that, you know, the conversation just flowed through well, right? You know, let alone having a child do something like that, right? And so, you know, at that age, though, I really do feel like talking to them, asking them, you know, you know, what they want to do, what they're comfortable with, rather than pushing them too, too hard is probably the right move. You know, I have a lot of kids, if you just kind of talk to them a little, a little longer, ask them just a few more probing questions, they're able to articulate like what makes them so uncomfortable with some of the interactions that they were previously so comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's really about baby steps here. I think that, you know, I don't think there's going to be long-term effects that we can't work on right now, that we can't manage, right? There's nothing that we can't work to fix right now. I think summer, camps, summer camps are a good way to kind of get started and ease back into it. And then maybe smaller group play dates. So, um, you know, instead of, again, expecting that in the fall, he's going to be in a classroom with 20 kids, perhaps just exposing him to five kids and just yeah. start with that and kind of get there. You know, so. mm -hmm. I am um, curious around what you're seeing in terms of when we think that there might be a vaccination for those under 12. We do expect to get hopefully FDA clearance this fall for two years and older. So okay. we are expecting that hopefully by the winter, we should be able to administer the, flu, uh, the COVID vaccine along with the flu vaccine um, to our kids two years and older. So um, and we don't see any reason why that wouldn't happen so far. You know, what I think is great about that, what um, Dr. Javadi had also mentioned already, is that we do know that children of different ages, people of different ages transmit the virus differently. So in that younger age group, right, they're less likely to kind of pass that virus along. So the fact that we're getting some of these older groups eligible for this immunization is, is great, right? It, mm -hmm. um, when do you think parents can expect schools to be opening the fall? Have you been hearing or, or tracking any of that? Um, and should be, and if they have an option, so I know a lot of schools are saying, you know, you have some choice about whether or not you want to do virtual or whether or not kids, you know, want, you know, yeah, kids to go into a physical classroom. You know, do you have recommendations for parents in terms of making that decision? Is it, does it okay for them to, to send their kids back to school? Yes. Even if they haven't gotten vaccination? 
I think so. I think um, this is a good time to let them go back to school in person. Um, again, just because we have a better understanding of the virus and how it's transmitted, um, and schools are going to be a little bit more cautious, perhaps the classes will be compressed. Um, it's possible that, you know, lunch recess will always be outdoors. It's never going to be indoors ever again. Um, lunch tables will probably get wiped down. So I think we'll have to put in some changes. Um, I think expecting a hybrid model is reasonable because some parents are just not going to be comfortable and that's okay. Um, but I think doing completely on Zoom is probably not healthy for your child anymore. I think a year plus was plenty. And I think that most of, from most of what I've been hearing that most schools are opening and whether it's going to be some sort of hybrid model, it's hard to say. Um, and I, I've definitely heard some kids say, no, we're, we're going back. Um, I think what the past year has showed us is actually though that a lot of these groups, these schools, they, I mean, they've been doing just such a great job at making sure that, hey, they're following all the protocols. So we're not seeing, you know, kids, you know, exposed in huge outbreaks. You know, I think they've done a really good job even in this past year, even without the knowledge that we have now. So um, all reassuring. Um, if for anyone who's in the audience, um, feel free to add questions, you know, continue in, in either on Facebook or in the Zoom chat. We're getting a few coming in. Um, so I'm curious, like, what, what is your advice that you're giving families about travel this summer? Well, you know, I think that there's some travel that you can do safely, right? You know, I mean, through all this, I'm saying, hey, you know what, you know, take a mini vacation, be safe, you know, you know, choose some place where you can be outdoors, right? You know, definitely depends on how old your kids are, right? And how safe they can stay, right? But, you know, I definitely think that, you know, we can get back out there and kind of follow the same rules that we've already kind of discussed, right? Making sure that, hey, you know, if we are in a closed, you know, in, in an indoor area, you know, keeping that mask on and following protocols that establishments have put into place, right? But otherwise, say, choosing outdoor activities where your kid can kind of not have that mask on and just kind of be around and, you know, be able to see other people and have fun, right? Yeah, like we talked about, I think flights are okay. It's just the airport that I'd be really careful. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question around uh, if you're setting up a play day, you know, how do you talk about to the other families about mask wearing expectations? Yeah, you know, that's where it's like health meets you know the social etiquette, and how do you handle those kinds of conversations? I think even before you set up the play date or you meet the other family, I think that should be clarified that you know, hey, I'm not comfortable coming into an environment with my child if everybody isn't masked. And so um, I think just setting the ground rules ahead of time will avoid the conflict later. Um, but again, like Dr. Hashi mentioned, if you're meeting outdoors, you're gonna sit in the backyard, you're gonna play outdoors, I think that's fine. You could take your masks off safely. Mm -hmm. I think that we're all kind of used to that question now. So if we, if we state it in a non-judgmental way and say, hey, you know, I just need to know this, you know, I think that most of us are expecting that question when we're kind of setting up those uh, play dates anyway. So definitely, you know, feel comfortable doing that, right? You know, for your peace of mind too. Yeah. Another question we're getting is, um, you know, does the Delta variant concern you at all? You know, is there some tipping point we should be looking for where that variant um, would change your recommendations for families? I mean, I think absolutely, you know, the variants have to be something that we, that, you know, we, we, we think about absolutely, right? You know, in, in our area here though, we, we've been, we have been doing well, right? But if suddenly things were to change, you know, we'll have to change along with them, right? You know, I think that the best things that we can do right now is not to drop all of our kind of caution here, right? To keep up with what we need to keep up with, masking indoors, you know, staying safe, hey, and if, you know, I have a child who's who's ill or something, not bringing them to public places, right? And saying, hey, let's protect everybody else and our family as well here, right? So I think if we continue to work as a community and be considerate of one another as we all have been, I think that, you know, we're in good shape to hopefully not have to take any steps backwards. Yeah, and I think as, as more of our uh, adult population has been immunized in this area, we hope that the Delta variant doesn't find susceptible hosts um, to infect. Um, so even if there is, and I'm seeing it also in our families, if 
a grandparent that was visiting from outside the country had the Delta variant when they came in, the two fa the family members that were immunized never got it. And um, so I feel like the more we immunize, the better our chances are, even if it is a variant that's not fully covered by the vaccine, I think it will offer moderate protection. So I think, again, kind of comes back to the more we immunize, the better. And I think at this point, we need to think about the vaccine as not just protecting you, but we need to think of it as a society for the greater good. So even if you don't personally believe in taking the vaccine or you don't work in an environment where you're exposed and you feel like, oh, I don't need the vaccine because I just work from home, it doesn't matter. You should get it anyway because it is for the society's good. So exactly. This is also how we um, how we prevent the opportunity for new variants to pop up too. So I think the faster we control this, the 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 more likely we're able to get back to our normal and and not have to deal with more and more variants. So really important to immunize. On that question of variants, we get a question around. Um, yeah, do we need to be concerned about any of these variants affecting kids um, who might who have more vulnerable health conditions? Are they at more risk to the variants? Yes, I do think that the Delta variant, first of all, it seems to be affecting kids disproportionately. Mm -hmm. um, and a child that has an underlying either immunocompromised situation or has a respiratory illness or has had a previous cardiac infection or um, mm -hmm. any of these might put a child at higher risk. Um, but I think the, the key thing is, like we said, immunizing the society around this child, hopefully getting the child immunized as soon as we can um, for the age, um, and then maybe picking activities that are low risk. Uh, what do you what a recommendation for parents? So parents uh, who are vaccinated, um, but they have kids under 12 in their home. Um, should they be following the recommendations for people who are vaccinated or unvaccinated? I've had a number of parents who are worried that um, even if they're vaccinated, they feel like they should still wear a mask because they, they wanna make sure that they're not bringing anything home to their kids. I agree. I think you should still wear a mask if you're in a closed situation. So if you're at work um, in, a, in a closed office or if you're gonna to go to the mall or the grocery store where there's a lot more people in a confined space, it's a good idea to wear a mask, even if you're immunized. So at least as a physician, we feel it's safest to wear a mask still. And I have to say, you know, and I, I choose to do that as well, right? For that reason that yes, you know, maybe I am less likely to be an asymptomatic carrier and pass that along, less likely to transmit the virus, but there is that possibility even to my vaccinated partner as well. So, so, uh, you know, it, I think that if we think that there's the risk there and we can mask, then, then masking is a good idea. Very helpful. Um, so how do you talk to kids who are under 12 who complain when wearing masks when they see adults and older kids not having to wear their masks now? And that's going to start to happen more because before everybody was wearing a mask and so kids understood, but now it's like, well, some people don't have to. Why do I have to wear one? You know, I think that that's a, I think that that's a really good question. And I'm sure every, a lot of kids are asking that, but I think especially at that age, they also understand a lot. And so by explaining it to them, I think a lot of kids, they'll understand, right? They'll say, Hey, you know what? That's their choice. Right. But our choice is to, you know, do this and that for these reasons, right. To make sure that we don't get other people sick. You know, this is how we're going to stay healthy, those types of things. Right. And so I think talking to them and explaining to them, hey, we're just, we're going to have to wear these masks during these certain situations, but hey, other times we won't have to, right? Because we know we're safe. Yeah, I'm envisioning being a parent of a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old, <laughs> one who was able to get vaccinated and one who is not. And, oh. You know, how, how might you as a parent navigate one kid, you know, not having to wear a mask technically and one kid who would have to under the same restrictions. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, it's just, thank God it's not a long wait. I think it's just a couple more months and hopefully um, the, uh, the younger child will also be uh, immunized. But um, yeah, I mean, I think I've never seen kids get so excited. I told a seven-year-old this morning that I think you're going to get your vaccine this fall. He's like, yes. <laughs> 
never we've never seen this so <laughs> yeah. hey i got a shot <laughs> i know um so it's 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 exciting for us but yeah i think it's just telling them i'm so sorry it's just you know and kids are smart they are accustomed to sibling conflict and sibling rep you know um conflict resolution so you know the older one's going to rub it in the younger one's face but they'll they'll figure it out <laughs> some of the younger ones even enjoy wearing it yes so I, I have used to it. Huh. they're like hey this is fun cute character you know yeah. and so you know <laughs> Um, this is a question that comes up all the time um, around, you know, are hugs okay? Yes. Um, and is if, if, if you're wearing masks, not wearing masks, just, you know, how, what are your recommendations for navigating hugs? Yes, hugs are okay. Again, because the bug is mostly um, um, transmitted by airborne. So it is okay. It is okay to hug a person, particularly if you're wearing a mask. And if the person's really sick and is shedding the virus, chances are they're really not out there, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're wearing a mask now, if, if someone was acutely sick and is actually shedding the virus, wearing a mask is actually, unless the mask is moist already, if it's a dry mask, it should protect you even so. So you can definitely hug. You need prolonged contact with the person who's sick. It's not just a passing contact. Uh -huh. That's really helpel because <laughs> you know kids want to they want to hug each other. I, yeah. I want to I mean, I want to hug my my friends and colleagues as well. Um, do you think that because we've seen both three feet and six feet for kids? Yeah, you know, like so a lot of schools are are going with the the three feet social distancing at a six feet. Do you have recommendations along that, or, or you know, do you have any um, sense of like what those restrictions are probably going to look like in the fall? Well, I think in order to accommodate more of the kids who will be choosing to go back into school, you know, the the the, uh, the distance had to had to decrease. Now that we do know, you know, a little more about the virus and how it's spread, how far, you know, we can spew, you know, uh, viral particles, um, how effective uh, it is to touch a surface. You know, having these kind of smaller distances is actually okay, right? On top of the fact that if you do have a sick child who is coughing and sneezing that child is not likely going to be in the middle of a classroom anyways. Mm -hmm. And so I think with the decreased distance, I think that that's okay as long as other precautions are being taken. And again, in the indoor setting, it's, it's about the ventilation, right? Making sure that things are not just staying stagnant in the air or, or even stagnant on like surfaces. Yeah, we increased our ventilation at the Tech Interactive for that very reason, Yeah, you know, just to awesome. make it as safe as we possibly could. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. So how do you allay fears um, for those who don't want to get vaccinated? You know, I think it's a lot, you know, there's so much information out there that I think that there's, um, that actually usually when I talk to parents, it's 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 me clarifying a lot of things about the about the vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the information about the adverse reactions, you know, you know, I'm getting a lot of questions about, you know, the cases of myocarditis, how do I feel about that, you know? And a lot of it's it's me comparing it to actually getting COVID, right? Mm -hmm. you know, where does the larger risk lie? Right. So I, I do feel like in just kind of just talking it through with them, I've had a lot of parents feel a lot better about saying, hey, I'm, you know, the vaccine is, is, is great. It's okay. Yes, there's going to be adverse reactions like with any, any immunization, um, but we know a lot about it and we have a lot of great data on it. And I always tell our families about the rapidity with which the vaccine came out. Like everybody's nervous about, well, this just yeah. came out in a year. I'm not comfortable yeah. with it. Um, so what I always tell them is the volume of patients that it was tested on. So when you're looking for polio or measles or tetanus, you need like 10 years of data to get like a thousand people in the study. But in the middle of a pandemic, we have thousands of patients that we've been able to test the vaccine on. So it's a very different. So we were able to gather data in a few months that would have ordinarily taken five to 10 years to collect. And so that's why it came out so quickly, not because it wasn't studied enough, but because we had enough patients to study it on. So that's always comforting for families to see, okay, in perspective, they didn't have 44,000 people uh, try the polio vaccine, for yeah. example, yeah. Um, and yet it was out and it's safe and everybody's handled it fine. So just to look, you know, put it in perspective. Yeah. So how do you feel about large amusement parks? You know, Disneyland is, is opened up recently. Um, yeah, where large crowds, um, they're not really being required to do social distancing. So I'm curious 
um, about if a parent says, hey, we're thinking about Disneyland, but uh, we have kids under 12, um, what would your recommendations be? That's a hard one. Um, but I would say because it's mostly outdoors, I think it's okay. Um, maybe pick times during the rides that are where it's not too crowded, where there's not a long line of people just packed in together. But otherwise, I think it would be okay. Um, wear a mask, please, if you can, uh, even if the others aren't wearing a mask. <laughs> I think that um, a lot of families are going to kind of weigh the risks here, right? You know, am I going to go on a ride where everybody's not masked and screaming? You know, <laughs> you maybe, you, maybe you consider that, right? <laughs> right. I agree. Yes. Um, you know, outdoors, great. But it is, it's quite crowded. So maybe, yes, you choose just like Dr. Javadi was saying, times when, you know, it's it's not as populated, right? Later in the day, right? You know, get some information perhaps from people who have already gone, you know, when, when should I go? You know, what are the safe rides I can go on? And we have time for a few more questions if anyone has any, um, like any, you know, any of our attendees. Um, I want to just kind of sum up some of what I um, heard too. Um, do you, like some of the recommendations are that, that um, kids, we should be focused on like kids hand washing, um, that that's one of the biggest ways um, and wearing a mask, you know, when you're indoors or in, in activities where you're in, in, inter interacting with other kids or adults. Um, that I was hearing that um, that adult to child is um, more likely to happen, uh, but child to child is actually unlikely to happen, just given how how the um, the vaccine come you know, um, trans not vaccine, but how the COVID um, transfers, wow. um, and that um, that generally like you're recommending that kids should be getting out there. We should be getting, being physically active. We should be making sure kids are on a schedule and getting sleep. That um, uh, recommending that that you know, two, yeah, like a few hours before, two hours before they go to bed, like um, no devices, which I think can be hard, um, but there's lots of healthy things for kids to be doing in, in that time period. Um, and the, one of the things that I was like, thought was a great um, insight was that it is, it is okay actually to hug um, because there's very minimal transference between um, you know, on surface, um, surface areas. So I'm curious if there are, there are other things, uh, actually, we've got one more question that just came in. Um, so do you anticipate full approval rather than emergency authorization for the, the vaccine to come soon? I know that, yeah, that kind of speaks to what you were talking about, Javadi, around um, uh, that you know, we did this you know, in a compressed time period, but in fact, we've actually you know, had a lot of the, the protocols and the volume in there. So you're expecting that to, to shift status soon? I think as far as I know, it's still going to be emergency authorization. Um, Tomomi, do you know anything different? I think it's emergency, but I think the, the point uh, that should also be made really is that emergency doesn't mean that there were any necessarily, that there wasn't um, shortcuts taken yes. to, uh, to get this approved, right? That there were no shortcuts taken um, to approve it, even with the emergency authorization. How do you guys feel about kids doing um, physical sports if they're unvaccinated? So like outdoor basketball or soccer, and should they be, because a lot of those are very um, locally, they're not requiring masks. Um, go, so for go for it. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> even if you're like jumping you know, running into each other. All right ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. We're outdoors, it's going to be fine. I think also, you know, I think sports teams too, right? They're very diligent about saying, hey, you know, if, if there's a kid who's sick, yeah, maybe they're sitting, they're not there participating in that kind of bodily contact, yelling and stuff like that. Um, and so that that reduces that risk. So, do you, um, I'm curious if you think that there's going to be a shift in terms of you know just kind of how we operate around sending kids to school when they're sick. You know, in the past, like for my mom, <laughs> like you know, like you had to be like dying before you were not allowed to go to you know to go to school. Um, and schools often recommend that too. I recently talked to superintendent. I was like, yeah, we're kind of changing our policy on that in terms of it. So I'm curious if you think even post COVID, whether or not um, we're going to, you know, as a society kind of change how we think about, you know, going to work or going to, to school sick. I think, I think so. yeah. Oh, oh um, you know, I, I think so. I think for at least a I want to say a few years, right. We'll all think just a little differently. We'll look back and say, Hey, you know, maybe 
maybe we don't send our kids to school or just at least wait till that they, they've recovered, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a little more, right? I think at some point though, we, we might end up kind of similar to where we were before, but maybe we'll be more diligent about saying, hey, mask, mask wearing is okay, right? You know, you know, maybe I'm not going out to a crowded restaurant if my kid's sick, you know, maybe we'll make some different choices there, right? But mm -hmm. um, I think we'll move back to a little closer to where we were before in maybe a few years is what I would think. Yeah, and I think it's also a little bit different. In the past, it used to be that every parent needed to be at work physically. Yeah. I think as more and more companies are realizing you don't really need to come in every day. And if you don't come in one day because your kid's sick, it's okay, please stay home and don't come. Um, and so I think that is helping a lot of our families not feel stressed about keeping a kid home. Um, and I agree with Tomomi on one thing, which I feel like over time, it will be socially considered okay to wear a mask if you're sick, even if you're not in the middle of a pandemic. And I am hoping that that's one habit that will continue because that would really help with flu transmission. It would help with so many other viruses that are airborne um, to just think that, I have a sniffle coming on. I don't even know if I'm sick, but I'm just gonna wear a mask today. It's going to do so much to protect people around me. Um, so hopefully that will continue. Um, if kids are masked in a classroom, do you think that vaccinated teachers need to wear a mask still? <laughs> That's a hard one. Um, yeah, it's been coming up, uh, yeah, because we, we've got educator partners to, yeah, it is key. Yeah, because uh, it's easier for them to communicate with kids if they, exactly. if they, don't, have, if they don't have their mask on. But we know that um, yeah, they're still. I think, still have to I think Katrina, if the uh, if the circulation is good, the door or windows open, and the teacher is like three to six feet away, I think it's okay to take the mask off. I think if she was right there in the midst of all the kids that are unimmunized, perhaps it would be good to wear the mask. But if you're standing in the in the front of the classroom, I think it's okay to take the mask off. And I think you made a really good point, Katrina, to say that, you know, it's easier to communicate and especially in some of your younger kids, right? Being able to see their facial expressions is very important. So, you know, for those teachers, for younger kids, maybe it makes sense to say, hey, you know, they, they don't have to wear the mask, you know, step back, let the kids see your face, you know, benefit from all of that, right? But maybe with the, with the older kids, you know, maybe they make different, the teachers can make different choices, right? Maybe it's, hey, everybody, else, everybody's masked, I'm going to mask as well, you know, right? Even if it is safe, right? Yep. We have a question from here, kind of circling back to one of the earlier things we were talking about, which is mental health. So what should parents do if they think their kids might be um, suffering from mental health issues like depression or anxiety? What would your recommendations be? You know, I always, I, I always want parents to let us know when something is going on, right? I think that we're going to do best if we act proactively here. You know, I have some, some kids coming in kind of like for their physicals, and then we have a whole list of concerns, right? And, you know, my hope for the future would be that parents would just bring it to our attention a little earlier, right? Have that conversation with the kid, or if they're not comfortable with that, then bring it to us so that at least we can make an evaluation of what we can we can best do for them at that time, right? Whether it's linking them with a mental health professional or just talking to them and figuring out what's really going on. Yeah, I'd say the first step is talk to your pediatrician, bring it up with the pediatrician. Um, we are you know, getting close to time. So I wanted to see if there was anything that we didn't cover um, or that you really wanna emphasize um, each one of you before we close out. I mean, I... Sorry, no, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Nina. I was just going to say, if I had to say one thing, it is get out there physically, get some activity, get some sunlight, uh, do meet friends, feel comfortable with activities that might be in closed settings as long as precautions are being taken. And um, I always tell all of my young patients, burpees suck, but they are so <laughs> good for you. <laughs> I'll stop with that. <laughs> No, um, I think that for me to, um, you know, I, I, I agree with you, Anita, um, really important. I want kids to start getting out there and feeling comfortable with it, right? You know, I don't want anybody to feel scared and or feel like, hey, you know, I should do this because everybody else is, right? Know that you're being safe and feel comfortable with that. Um, but also, I, I want kids to know and parents to know that they're 
that they're not alone, right? You know, I have a lot of kids coming and saying, you know, this is happening to me. You know, why can't I do this? You know, why can't I Zoom chat with my friends? Well, you know what? None of, a lot of us can't, right? And so they're not alone, right? We're going to work together. And parents, they again, they have such a huge responsibility. And I know that it's been super challenging, but they're not alone. And, you know, we're doing our best to come up with good, clear guidelines to help them feel comfortable. So I want to thank you, um, both Dr. Um, Javadi and Dr. Hayashi. And um, also, you know, I want to thank um, Stanford Children's Health for you know, partnering with us on this. And I want to thank all of you who, um, who visited with us today and who are guests. And to let you know that, that we did record this, so this will be available. So if um, you have friends who think that, oh, this would be really good information for them to hear, um, we'll make sure that you have um, access to that. Um, also, just to let you know that Stanford Children's Health website has a lot of really great additional articles that will help parents with both the COVID pandemic, but also general health questions you might have your kids. And we'll put it in the chat, but, um, but the website is stanfordchildrens.org. Um, like I said, this will be available if you find it helpful and you want to be able to share with your friends. Um, and also, I'm going to always make a, a flag that the tech is open on the weekends, and I uh, we would love to see you all soon. Um, we have lots of ventilation. We have lots of space, lots of places for kids to be able to um, really you know, get back to learning and fun and having some excitement. Um, and uh, so come visit us. And thank you again. Thank you for thank giving you. us a chance to get the message out. Thank you. That was great. Thank you.